First of all, good morning. Let's start by doing a show of hands. And uh, who here is having a good time? Nice. That's really nice. I'm actually having a great time. So, um, uh, but let's take a picture together. Are you folks down for that? Do you want it? All right, let's do it. So that's going to be a quick one. All right, so everyone smile. Yay. That is awesome. I'm definitely going to share that later on Twitter, so follow me up if you want to see it. So um, I actually have some bad news. So the bad news is that we are going to talk about some really complex stuff. We are going to talk about some stuff that is kind of hard to understand and uh, that can be an issue. But the good news is that we're also going to talk about some good stuff. We're going to talk about how to solve those issues and how to actually, uh, actually build good software. So that's something that we should be excited about. All right, so um, the name of the title of this talk is State Machines and Elixir, but I definitely could have named it better. I believe that a better name for it would be uh, Avoiding Complexity in Software Design. That is catchy and sexy, so that is definitely would be a better name for it. Or maybe I could do even better than that and just named it uh, that time I fell for my skateboard. And uh, don't worry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to definitely tell that story next, so don't worry about that. Do you folks remember these tiny skateboards that they released a few years ago and everyone was really loving it? So around seven years ago, I was working at CodeMiner, one of the sponsors of the conference, by the way, and uh, a friend of mine actually brought one of those keyboards, one of those skateboards, and everyone was like just looking at it, saying like, mm, it seems fine, should I give it a try? And people asked me if I want to ride it, and that was like, Man, this shit is easy. I mean, I had all the confidence in the world that I could easily ride that. So I said, hold my beer. I got this one. And I got on the skateboard, and I started riding and riding. And I was through the tables and through the computers, and that was awesome. And when I got by the end of the office, I actually tripped, and I fell in my back really hard. I mean, really, really hard. And um, I was lucky enough there was someone filming it and actually sent that to Faustão. And I showed up in Video Cacetadas on April 8th of 12, 2012. And uh, I swear that I tried to find the video to share with you, but it seems to not be available anymore. So if any of you know someone that works at Globo, let me know because I need to find that video. All right, so jokes aside. I fell, and I started with a small pain in my back. Just a small pain, nothing serious. I was like, all right, I can handle that. But a few days passed by, and the pain started to get stronger. So it got stronger, and then I started to get some pain meds. I was like, ah, uh, I should probably go to the doctor, but who needs doctors, right? And uh, I had all those projects that I really wanted to work with, and I didn't want to go to the hospital, so I like, fuck this, I would just keep leaving. But more days passed, and I started to limp a little bit on my right leg. And I even got myself a crutch so that I could support myself. And then um, as these days comes by, the pain started to get really serious. I got into, I couldn't walk anymore. I got into bed. My legs didn't work anymore, and I had to go to the hospital. And once I got there, I figured out that the impact that I had had actually triggered a tumor that I had in the past and I didn't know about it, and that got inflamed. So it had to be surgically removed. All right, I went through the surgery and uh, I spent a couple of days in the hospital and recovering and all that. And after that, I went to the, to, to back to my place and spent some days recovering in there as well. And then I was back into work, working as usual. And in time to watch me on, on national wide television, so that was a good thing. And um, you might be asking you, why I'm telling you this, right? I mean, why I'm sharing this story? This is a sad story. <laughs> and uh, there is one reason why I'm sharing this. And the reason is that I learned something from this that I think that it's worth sharing. And the lesson that I learned is that things can get complex really fast. In a matter of days, I went from normal to couldn't walk and needed a surgery. 
And that is something that we as developers can definitely relate to because that happens with us all the time. We start to work on features, we get small features and we start to work on that and features start to get complex and you need to add dependencies and you need to talk to other teams and there, there, there's a product owner that came up with another crazy idea to build on top of that. So things start to get so complex that it's, the system becomes hard to change and that becomes a liability not only for the, for the software but for the company that is actually paying for you to build that software. So imagine for a second a future where maintaining software is not a pain in the ass where you can build a feature today in like one year from now, two years from now, you can pick that up and you can still extend it and you can still work on that. Wouldn't that just be awesome, having a future where you can work on this complex stuff and be really easy to handle that? Programming may not be that hard for everyone. I mean, there are some people that actually think that programming is easy, but uh, building real and good software is so much more than programming. Building real good software is thinking, it's planning, it's designing, and designing actually plays a huge role in this. Just to make myself clear, and I'm not, talk how, I'm not talking about visual design, I'm talking about software design. And uh, for a lot of people, software design is just a matter of breaking things down. So uh, breaking features into smaller ones, breaking dependencies into smaller ones. But I don't agree with that. There's so much more into software design than just breaking things now. So I actually tweeted uh, and asked some people, what do you think that software design is? What do you think that is the goal for software design? And I even asked some people in the conference yesterday how they feel about it. And um, some people said that it's an art. That's the art of arranging code. Other people said that's a picture, so we are painting a picture of the future, of how the future will look like. But I don't agree with both of those. I believe that the goal of software design is to reduce the cost of future change. That's the main goal for software design, and that is actually a great definition of quality code. Quality code has low cost of change. Quality code is the code that you can actually change easy in the future and you can extend and be on top of that. So uh, most of people don't spend much, they spend much time designing software. They just jump straight development. And uh, that happens because the whole web framework and the web scenario actually helps you to do that. So the frameworks nowadays are so easy that you just jump straight and start developing it and you don't worry about actually thinking about what you're developing, thinking about how, how those parts are going to integrate together. And that is actually something that is, that is really bad because it's going to get to a point where there's no turning back and maintaining that software is so hard that it just costs too much money or too much time because it got really complex. And uh, don't get me wrong, I could have a whole talk about software design and software complexity and how to avoid it, but I actually need to talk about state machines. <laughs> so um, state machines is just one of these concepts and the reason why I decide to talk about state machines is because it's one of these features that starts really easy really simple, but it can get complex really fast. It has a hidden complexity into it that most of developers don't realize. Most of developers might not even know what a, syst what a, what a state machine is. So uh, for those that doesn't know me, my name is João Moura. I'm currently an engineering manager at TopTal. Uh, how many of you know TopTal? All right, so um, I'm an engineering manager there, managing multiple teams. We have hundreds of developers. I also spend a lot of time blogging and talking in conference around the globe. So if you're interested about that, let me know and let's connect it together. I spend most of my career programming Ruby, Elixir, and Python, doing some data science. And for the past four years, I have basically been working with uh, startups in San Francisco and New York. But I can talk about me uh, later down the road. Let's jump to what really matters. So um, what are we are talking again? State what? State machines. Uh, so let's talk a little bit what a state machine is. So the definition of a state machine is it's an abstract machine that can be in exactly one of a finite number of states at any given time. What the fuck that means? So. It may sound complex, but it's actually really simple. 
A state machine is just a set of states, so different states, and the transitions between those states. So you have a resource, and this resource can be anything, a user, a shopping cart, whatever, and this resource is going to have multiple states, and it will move from one state to another. And there's a lot of rules behind that, and this is what a state machine is. It's just a math concept created for computer science. I believe that the best way to explain something is through examples. So let me go through some examples of what a state machine is. I believe that the best example for state machines is a shopping cart, because it's pretty well known, and everyone has tried to buy something online nowadays. So a shopping cart has four different states. You have an empty state, you have a filled state, you have a paid state, and you have an abandoned state. But you also have the transitions between those states. So from empty to filled, you need to add an item to the shopping cart. From filled to paid, you need to check out. And from filled to abandoned, you need to leave the website and leave the shopping cart in there. So let's imagine for one second that you work in an e-commerce and you were hired to implement that into that software. So you actually need to create this state, this state machine in the code. And my question to you is, where will this logic leave? Well, you might say some of this, let, let's go back and check it. So you probably say, I need a new, I need a new data uh, on the database. I need a new field in the database to record the state of the shopping cart. So you're going to update the database. You're probably going to need to update the model as well. And you might need to add some stuff in the controller. So you might need to add new action to add an item, actions to remove the item, maybe another action to check out, actions to leave, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so that's pretty much it, right? But it's never that simple. <laughs> Actually, uh, if we take a deeper look, and remember when I said state machines look simple at the beginning, but they're definitely really complex. So let's take a deeper look at this state machine that we have just talked about and just the initial transition from empty to filled. When we zoom in and start to take a deeper look into it, we're going to see that between the empty and the filled state, by adding an item, you have other stuff into it. So first, there is a question when try to add an item. Do, you, do we have this item in the stock? If we don't have this item in the stock, then the shopping cart should go back into the empty state. If we have that item in the stock, then we need to lock this item so that we don't sell it twice for different people. All right, so we lock that item. And only after that, we actually transition to a filled state. So between one state and another, we have other things that are called guard conditions and callbacks. So guard conditions are things that are supposed to prevent the transition from happening. So if we don't have that item to stock, there is no reason to, transi to transition to another state. So prevent this transition from happening or guard, or guard this transition. And, uh, and you have callbacks that are basically triggered by these transitions, are functions that are triggered or before or after those transitions. In this case, it's before the transition to lock that item. All right, so that starts to get a little bit complex, a little bit more complex. And if we apply some of those rules into the uh, rest of the state machine, then it starts to look a little bit ugly. So uh, if you go from filled to paid, you actually need to check if the payment is confirmed or not. If you go from filled to abandoned, you actually need to unlock these items from the stock. And uh, that can start to go sideways. And there are some stuff that I'm not even putting here, uh, like removing an item and how that would work. Uh, there are other callbacks in there and other transitions. So now I ask you again, where this logic will live? And I'm going to tell you, everywhere. That's where this logic will live. <laughs> You're going to have parts of this logic into your model. You're going to have part of this logic into your controller. And I mean, if you don't know what you're doing, you might even have some logic in your views. And um, if you have a little bit more experience, maybe you'd say, all right, I'm going to create a new class just to handle that. And uh, this class is going to be a pure Ruby class, for example, and that's going to encapsulate all my logic. But I believe me when I say that still is going to leak into models and other stuff. And uh, even, if the, even if it don't, I mean, it's still, it's complex. 
And one thing that we don't realize as users and developers is that state machines are also everywhere everywhere around us. So it's not only shopping carts, but you also have user states. A user can be like incomplete, complete, block, unblocked. Uh, it's uh, orders. So when you order something, that order can be processing, processed, being manufactured, shipping or chipped, or messages. When you send a message, it can be like it's leaving from your phone, it got into the other phone, the other people might have read it or might have not read it. So there's a lot of different states. And basically all softwares that we build nowadays have some sort of state machine and we just don't realize it. So I would like to share a little bit of a story of I faced a huge state machine. So hold on to our butts because that's gonna be a tough one. <laughs> so. I was working in a company, I can't tell the name of the company, but I was working in a company that was basically an e-commerce. We had not such a big team, but quite a mid-sized team. And uh, the difference between these e-commerce specifically from other e-commerce is that, one, they are growing like crazy. I mean like 20% month after month. That is a good thing. And two, they actually manufactured the items that they sell. So they're not selling something that is ready. When you go to their website and buy something, they're actually gonna manufacture that in an industry and then send you that. So there's this one factor that changes everything. So people would go to the website, they would fill in the shopping cart, and there's not only the shopping cart states anymore, but now you have an order state. So your order would be initially processed by the system, then it would be internally checked by someone that works in the company, then it would go for a production line. In this production line, it would be initially produced, and there's a lot of different states in the production steps. Then we would send back a sample to the customer so the, so the customer can approve it or not. If the customers approve it, then we manufacture the rest of it, and then we go to shipping states. So it's going to be picked up, and uh, it's going to be delivered, and there are all different states on the shipping side of stuff. If the user doesn't approve the sample, then it goes back into the production line. I mean, you can picture that. We are talking about more than 20 states, more than 20 fucking states, and you need to manage that. And it's not only the states that are complex, but the transitions as well. Because the order could be not only one way, but it can go backwards. So if the user doesn't approve a sample, it can go backwards to other states. And you have to handle all the callbacks and all the guard conditions in there. So basically the way that they, they were solving that was using Trello. Yeah, Trello. So how many of you have used Trello in the past? All right, all right, that's a good one. So Trello is basically a project management tool. But I figured out that it can also be used as a database. Check this out. Basically, they would have these lanes, and each card would represent an order. So whenever a user go to the website and buy something, through Trello API, they would create a card that would be the order with all the user information in there. And the folks in the production line can actually open Trello and see what they need to produce. And then can move those cards around and that would trigger a message backwards to the system so that we update the state in the system. So it was a two-way binding with Trello as database. And uh, when I joined the company and I, I saw that, I was like, man, <laughs> this is a fucking Frankenstein. How am I supposed to maintain that? I was stunned about it, really. I still can't process that. And I know that I still kind of use it, so. All right. What happens next? I, I, I should probably give you a little bit more context. So this uh, software was built using a beautiful language. Oh, did I mute myself? No? Oh. All right, my bad. All right, so um, this software was built using a beautiful language called Elixir. How many of you have done Elixir in the past? Nice. Uh, 
I'm going to give some context for those that haven't. So Elixir is a functional language, and I love functional languages in general. And uh, what, what, means, what being a functional language means? So the best way to explain what a functional language is, is to summarize it in two rules. I have tried to summarize it, but it's basically a functional programming 101. It's way more than that. It's, them, it's way more deeper context. But let's say that we want to just ha get everyone at the same state, right? The first rule is that in functional programming languages, you, f your functions must not update values outside of it. So what it means, you have a function, and this function can do whatever it wants inside of it. But it shouldn't update any values outside of the function. All right? Simple rule. And the second rule is that functions must not depend on any variables other than its parameters. So if you have a function, you shouldn't get a value that is outside of it. If you want to send something to in it, you send it as a parameter. Two simple rules that basically explain functional programming 101. Uh, that is not always true. There are some edge cases and there's way more stuff into it, but that's basically it. So uh, for those that does Ruby, this is basically a well-known Ruby code. Basically, you're calling a method called DAO case into an Elixir string. And uh, the way that you're doing that is because Elixir is actually an object. It's an instance of the string class so that you can call methods on it. Pretty straightforward. If you did that into Elixir, that would look a little bit different. Basically, the functions are grouped by modules. So the down case function is grouped inside the string module. So if you want to call it, you have to say string dot down case. And you pass elixir, the string elixir, as a parameter for that function. All right? Pretty straightforward. And um, another, good, another good thing that you probably should know is that elixir is built on top of another great language call it Erlang, and also use Erlang's virtual machine. Erlang, for those that doesn't know, it's a third year old language. It's fucking awesome. <coughs> it's fucking awesome. It has uh, a lot of software building it, a lot of different libraries, So, uh, and you can use that in Elixir, so that's a good thing. So if you're using Elixir, you can easily import a library from Erlang and use that into your code, bo in your code base, and that makes things a little bit easier. So when I joined that company, and I saw that mess, and I was thinking, how can I solve this complex state machine? I decided to look up to Erlang and see what Erlang folks have done in the past that could help me solve this problem. So the first solution that I saw was Gen State M. That's an um, implementation of state machines built in into the standard library of Erlang. Um, it, it, Building in standard library basically means that it's shipped within the language. So it's part of the language and you can use that. So uh, it's called a low level implementation for state machines as processes. And it's what they call an event driving state machine. So I start to look that up, see how that would look like. And that's the, ba the most basic example that I could came up with. This is the code. All right, that's, you can see that, right? That is really good, all right. So uh, let's go through phases here. And don't worry if you don't understand. I don't want to get too technical in this part. But let's just go through it. So uh, the initial, holy shit. No? All right, all right. Initial boilerplate code, just importing GenStateM, defining a name for this state machine. Then we move forward, and we basically uh, start a new process, saying that uh, what is going to happen when you start this process. Then this is the actual function that we're going to create the initial state and the initial data. Uh, moving from there, you have more boilerplate code just saying uh, how the state is going to be transitioned. So in this case, we are saying that it's going to be through functions. Uh, then you have the uh, function that actually will uh, trigger the transition from one state to another. And by last, you have the actual trans transition from one state to another. Man, that looks complex as fuck. I mean, it looks how much boilerplate code. Even people that program Elixir find that hard to understand. It's not something that you look and you say, I got it. I got it. It's simple. So, I mean, it's complexity. It's that kind of things that makes it hard for us to extend it down the road. It's these kind of things that make it hard for other people to 
catch up on the work that people have done in the past and build on top of that. So that doesn't look at like the solution that I was looking for. That was just lame. It doesn't fit the purpose of building good software, building quality software and avoiding complexity. So I moved on to another solution that was called FSM that was built by a well-known developer into the Elixir community called Sasha. And uh, they basically define it as a pure functional finite state machine, pretty much it. And this is the example that, the simplest example that I could came up with. That's way simpler. I mean, it does came up with a new DSL. So you have this def state and uh, you define all the states that you have, but I still couldn't understand it. I mean, I looked at it and I was like, man, I'm gonna need to read the documentation to understand how to use that. And uh, if other people that have never done, never worked with this in the past, try to look this up, they will not understand it as well. So it doesn't feel like the solution that I was looking for and it didn't fit the project that I had. So I decided it was time for me to came up with a different solution. And that's when machinery was born. Unlike Gen State M, Machinery actually doesn't run its own processes. It actually runs on top of a functional data structure. So whatever data structure that you have, it's gonna work on top of that. And um, I needed something that would enable me to implement it fast and that would remove the complexity out of it so that people can extend it in the future. Something that would allow me to focus on the software that I'm building and uh, enable people to extend it uh, easily. So let's go by steps. Let's say, how do you declare states in machinery? How do you declare states for a state machine? This is basically it. Even if you don't know the Elixir, you're definitely gonna understand it. So the first line is basically creating your module. It's gonna be user state machine. The second line, you are importing machinery. The third line, you're setting the states that you're gonna have. So you're gonna have three states, created, partial, and complete. Pretty much it. And then you declare the transitions that you want. So I can go from created to partial or complete, and I can go from partial to completed. That's all you needed. It's as simple as that. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that simple to understand? And that was something that I really liked it. And, uh, what about actually transitioning from one state to another? So basically all you need to do is call the transition to method and you're gonna pass the resource that you want to transition, in this case a user, you're gonna pass the state machine that we just declared and the name of the next state that you want to transition to. That is, that is it. And uh, so let's get a little bit more complex. What about guard functions? We talked about that, right? Guard conditions, how do we fix that? All right, so that's pretty much simple as well. You basically can create functions, in this case, call it guard transition, and by using pattern matching, you can say what, fun what transition you're guarding. In this case, we are guarding the completed transition. So whenever transition to the completed state, this function will be called, and if it returns uh, a Boolean, like a true or false, it's gonna allow the transition to go through or prevent it from ever happening. And that's, that's as simple as that. All right, but we still have another problem. What about the before and after callbacks that we have? We have that as well. We have to unlock items and unlock items. Do you remember that? So this is also pretty simple. Basically, you can create, following the same pattern, before transitions and after transition functions that will be executed whenever you're transitioning from one state to another. And that is basically it. This is really easy to read, and that enables people to understand what is going on. So let's go to a real example so that you can see how powerful that is. Let's go back to our shopping cart. Uh, so how would, how would we implement the shopping cart state machine using machinery in Elixir? This is basically it, all right? This is basically it. So initially, we create or we say the states that we're gonna have, in this case, empty state, filled state, paid, and abandoned. Then we say the transitions that are gonna have, so from empty to filled, and from filled, it can go to paid or abandoned, pretty straightforward. Then we have two guard conditions. Whenever going to the filled state, check if we have that item in the stock, and whenever going to the paid state, check if the payment is confirmed. That's it. And then we have two before and after transitions, two callbacks, that basically says that 
whenever you go to the filled state, lock the item so that no one else, no, no one else can buy it. And whenever you transition to the abandoned state, unlock that item so that other people can buy it. Check how awesome it is. Your state machines can be grouped into files, and all the logic is pretty well defined. I mean, it's easy to spot, it's easy to maintain, it's easy to extend. Isn't that just great? So, uh, and that was not it, because I knew that the production line folks still needed a visual interface. They still needed a way to actually see what they needed to work on. So there was a bonus into it. Basically, with six lines of code. So if you're using Phoenix, that is a framework in the Elixir, uh, and you add the six lines of code, you can actually have a visual interface that represents the state machine that you build. So you can have the see the resources, and you can even move a resource from one state to another, like in Trello, but that will automatically run the callbacks and the guard transitions, and that will make sure that that transition is declared. So if I try to move to an undeclared transition, it's going to say that this transition is not declared in your state machine document. So you can easily have a visual interface to know what are your building and what are the state of that without any uh, integra remote integration like sending information to Trello or whatever. So uh, that is really awesome. <laughs> I, I'm really proud of that. And I released this project for the first time in January. And I was working on that before that. Uh, so far, we have 5,500 downloads. But uh, every day or so, there are more people downloading it and using it. So it seems that people are liking it. If you want to contribute to it and if you want to help me to develop it, make yourself comfortable to jump in and go to the GitHub or ask me on Twitter. Uh, by the way, that's something that I didn't say, but if you have any questions, because we don't have questions here, uh, hit me up on Twitter. I'm going to go over that, and I reply everything online. So uh, don't be afraid of that. I'm going to show my contacts in the end. So uh, if you want to know more about it, and if you want to support machinery, make sure to hit me up on Twitter or check at GitHub. And there's a readme in there. There's issues. You can definitely figure out what we need from there. All right. Now I wanted to get to go a step back, right? We have been rushing into this. <laughs> let's take a step back, a deep breath, and let's talk about the stuff that you can't forget about this talk. Are you ready for this? I see some nodlings. All right. Awesome. So first thing, state machines are everywhere. And I mean everywhere. We have state machines into uh, our everyday apps. We have machines into the state machines into the softwares that we have been building. And state machines are just one example of complex problem that needs to be tackled. But there's a lot of other complex problems out there that we need to tackle as well. So be aware when developing software that you might need a better understanding of what a state machine is. Second thing that you can't forget from this talk <laughs> Second thing that you can't forget from this talk is that machinery is a great tool to implement state machines if you're building an Elixir application. So if you're building a really complex state machine, maybe you might want to check those other solutions that I mentioned, but machinery is actually a solid solution that can help you developing that. So if you're building an Elixir app, take that into account. But the third thing is the most important thing that you can't forget from this talk is that things can get complex really fast. In the future, I see two options, right? So the first one is we start to care about software design and about building quality code. And the second one is we are stuck building apps that won't scale, that won't, ma that won't uh, mate the user future needs. And apps that are going to be required for you to add more cores, more computers, more resources, and more engineers to it just to keep delivering the same result. I prefer the first option. I prefer build quality code. I prefer build code that will last. 
But in order to do that, we need to start to design better code. We need to start to dig into problems like state machines and sometimes build new solutions like machinery. I do hope that this talk or that me or that machinery actually inspires you to do that, actually inspires you to think about software differently and to build better code so that we can build this future together. Thank you so much. <laughs> Quick thing. If you want to know more about TopTal or anything that I mentioned in this talk, these are all my contacts online. So hit me up on Twitter, Facebook, or my blog, or whatever. Make yourself comfortable. Uh, I actually, I won't stay much. I won't be into the end of the conference, but you can still get me in the lunch. So thank you so much. Have a good one.